This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. Hi, I'm Raghu Marcus, and welcome to another edition of Ramdas Here and Now. And uh, we are going to listen to a talk that Ramdas gave. Gee, I'm not sure when on this one. Getting dizzy with all of our. Well, just to tell you what's going on, we are going through and we we are looking actually for a grant, so everybody out there knows, anybody who can help us, we'd love to know about it, but it's a grant for uh, the uh, digitizing uh, Ramdas's media library, and not just Ramdas, it includes many of his uh, spiritual friends, writer friends, uh, etc., from Ginsburg to... Uh, Allen Ginsberg to Deepak Chopra. So uh, we're we're going to do this. So we're going through and we're cataloging everything, and in preparation for digitizing and meta tagging and descriptions and everything, so people can access through uh, search engines the uh, exactly what content they want to access, be it around death and dying or suffering or. Uh, you know, any any of the subjects that Ramdas has discussed over the years, which are many, many, many. So I'm a little dizzy because I've been going through that with someone today. And, uh, uh, well, every day we it, it comes up. It, uh, it It's amazing. And I say this every time almost because I am blown away. Every time I come upon something I either never heard or have forgotten and... How incisive on so many different subjects uh, Ramdas has been, and um, this one is a talk. It's about Aldous Huxley, and I thought this this might be something great for people who, um, and you know, there may be people who are not that aware of Aldous Huxley. Have heard of him? He died in 1963. He wrote Brand New World amongst a number of books. Doors of Perception, Heaven and Hell, which were actually large articles that were put into a book. And my favorite, and what I identify him with, is called Island. And, um, you know, and I, when did I, God, I don't know, I was really young when I read. So th this has to be one of the first transforming um elements and uh, I've talked about this before from back at that time and the music was certainly one of them of course uh, the the biggest one was psychedelics now but before I uh, am engaged uh, with uh, mind alt mind altering substances I uh, came upon this book now this uh, well, there's. I came upon upon Aldous Huxley, and um, particularly this, uh, the first book I want to talk about is the Doors of Perception. I mean, at the time that I read that, and I would say I was probably around eighteen or something like that. I was feeling like a prisoner in this normal world of perceptions. I was feeling caught completely in that paradigm that we understood was true reality. And um, so I was. I felt like a prisoner. I mean, it's a great uh, analogy and, uh, and was, you know, pretty unhappy. So here comes Aldous Huxley, uh, Doors of Perception, way before Acid, before uh, Leary and Alpert. Um, he imbibed in mushrooms and had a completely altered experience. And his thing before that was about exploring the mind's remote frontiers and the unmapped areas of human consciousness. And this is from a tagline for uh, on the back of one of these books. Um, 
but with doors of perception it was a, it, he really got into studying the effects of mind expanding drugs and this is way before anybody else was talking about it or anything was happening so he is what a real upa guru we would call him from india upa guru meaning a this a, a, not a guru as a finished realized being but as a guru who uh, who takes and crystallizes something and points the way along your path so he definitely was that and uh and he was that for ramdas and in this talk ramdas really expresses uh how grateful the he he was to have uh um met he met all this at one time i, th I don't know how many times but i think you'll hear it in in the talk but uh it was an, a profound impact on his life absolutely and especially when they started doing mushrooms um now back to island and back to which which i really love and i can't recommend it uh, more highly it it's uh so it's a book about an ideal society that was flourishing that flourished in a in a uh south sea island and that uh, society got intruded upon by a ship shipwrecked person who uh was he actually was going there cuz on behalf of some multinationals to get oil rights or something from this island so these people so he saw he saw the values that had been created by these people in this utopian world and he learned about hope that's what i got out of this thing when i read this book again i was <laughs> back to the analogy of the prisoner you know in in the in the normal world perception this this gave me other world perception for sure and but mostly what it, and and that perception was around i i'd only think about this now because i didn't know anything about it then but it was a way of relating to what the buddhists call buddha nature to a way of seeing what that's really like he actually through this novel and through this narrative you could get a feeling for what this nature pure nature pure being is like and hope was there so he he's definitely a major upa guru as they call it pointing the way aldous huxley i remember um i ramdas i remember him telling some story about all this um before he died i mean literally when he 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 was days away or maybe it wasn't that long but at the end of his life he was taking a lot of acid and um ramdas remembers either i guess it's either Laura, he became very friendly with uh, aldous's wife uh, laura huxley ramdas did and maybe it came through her i can't quite remember but he'd walk around on acid right at that cusp of being in one foot in one foot out even if it was months before and he couldn't speak all he could say was extraordinary extraordinary he just look around <laughs> and he got the essence of everything so introducing you to Aldous Huxley and here's Ramdas here and now talking about Aldous Gene I am humbled and honored that you would introduce me Gene's remarks were absolutely brilliant don't you agree Thank you. Uh, these remarks are in honor of Aldous Huxley and also of Laura Huxley. That um in fact without Laura Huxley this lecture would not be happening. And never underestimate the power of Laura Huxley. <laughs> In fact, I have to show Laura, I must show you 
that I am wearing the socks. She, she demanded that I wear higher stockings. She said it was improper to wear such... So I have calf stockings for Lauren. <laughs> And when she asked me to speak about all this, um, to say I was intimidated was a mild statement. My last image, or one of the images I have of all this, not my last one, but one of them, I'm at a party in the Hollywood Hills, and I have never met Aldous. And um, in the corner, in two chairs, chatting, are um, Gerald Hurd and Aldous Huxley, two giants of the intellect. And um, I, um, I'm a young, um, brash Turk from Harvard, recently psychedelicized. <laughs> so I am now becoming one of the darlings of the Hollywood set as a connection, no doubt. <laughs> and um, so I sidle over at, in order to listen. And I hear them discussing um, the experience of walking through the labyrinths of uh, abbeys, of abbey gardens, and the feelings that it generates. And the associative tracks of these people, uh, Aldous was two years, four years older than my father. So my relationship to Aldous is one of uh, awe and deep respect. And for me to even presume to speak about him and about his work <sighs> humbles me, humbles me. And what I've gotten from uh, readings this winter of Aldous's, some of Aldous's work, is not so much a set of answers, although there it is, they are loaded with answers, but a very um, provocative experience, forcing me to the edge of my consciousness time and again to explore the issues that he was exploring. And I can understand his saying to Jean, well, then you must do it. When she was unwilling to allow the solution that all this had arrived at in Ireland. In a little while I'll discuss these books, but first, um, dealing with one of the provocative issues. And it's an issue that I think pervades these meetings. Because these meetings have been full of the most beautiful possibilities for our ultimate investment. Experiences and dreams and programs and plans. But at the same moment, underlying it, was the continuous question is it too late? Is it too dark? Are we just a little whisper in the roaring winds of a tornado? What do we do? Do we need to do something dramatic? The question to Ashley last night was, couldn't you go on the Bill Moyer show so millions of people could hear that what we need to do is love one another? And he said, well, Bill Moyes doesn't really want to hear that. He didn't say it that way, but that's roughly. There's not really too much room for good news. Some time ago, I was um, connected, maybe 20 years ago, with um, a Tibetan Lama named Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. He and I taught together at Naropa the first year. And in response to this question, 
about despair. Trungpa said, one has to stand halfway between hope and hopelessness. If one is afraid of looking at the hopeless part, one is no longer free to act in a free way because one's anxiety about the outcome colors one's perception so deeply that one is unable to experience the gestalt out of which an appropriate response occurs. That one must look at the possibility that it all turns dark and darker and darker. I remember once being in the, uh, near the temple that I'm connected with in India, in the foothills of the Himalayas, the Kamoan Hills, and visiting the ashram of a saint who had lived maybe 50, 60 years ago. Sambari Maharaj. And when one of his devotees had asked him, he said, there will come a time when you will walk five miles and you will see a light, a firelight in the distance, and you'll be so happy to know another human being still is alive. This was a man who had great, great wisdom and siddhis or powers. And that image chilled me deeply. Was I really ready for Shiva's dance? And in this morning presentation, we'll have the delight of Chung Liang, Al Wang, and I uh, dancing to Shiva. Because I think if we come out of this conference with the willingness to undertake the venture to look directly at what is, setting aside our dramatic responses, just looking at what is, out of that will come, very intuitively, your next act. And it will be the optimum act that you can make. Edmund Burke said, what you do may seem insignificant, but it's very important that you do it. I'm sorry, he said, there's two lines I have. Well, that's Gandhi. Burke's line was, the worst mistake is to do nothing because you can only do a little. As Brother David in the group discussion last night talked about us trying to solve the problems at the level at which our minds are functioning rather than having relationship with the mystery of the universe and staying at the edge of the mystery of the universe with the unknown and still acting. He said there are forces behind what one can see of which we are part. When I find that somebody calls because they are sick or frightened and I am on the phone and I find myself feeling deeply peaceful and listening and feeling my heart responding to their pain and at the same moment the equanimity of being with the mystery and watch the process happen between the two of us. I just feel that the two of us make up the beautiful, beautiful relationship between compassion, the giving and the receiving of the compassionate moment. And it's one thing and nobody's doing anything for anybody. 
It's a process, and we are gathered here because we are part of the compassionate response. And it's interesting that the purer one's heart becomes, the more the tiniest act is that which resonates in an appropriate fashion to bring a deeper harmony, a deeper way back into the Tao, as if one ever left it. These are the kinds of questions that Aldous's work awakens in me. He calls forth, just as he did in Jean, he calls forth in me the desire to be the pure instrument. When one sees there is nothing left but purification and remembrance. Every time I forget, I remember. And of course, every time I remember, I forget. Until the forgetting and the remembering are all part of one thing. Ah, forgetting. Ah, remembering. You and I are embarked on such an extraordinary dance, which is what all this was embarked on himself. Now, I've been reflecting about all this's life, and uh, Gene gave one interpretation. Aldous was a, um, he was often referred to as a dis dispassionate person. We also know he was very passionate about what he believed in, but he was a dispassionate person. Now, Ashley spoke last night about the cold fish style that came out of the English educational system. So I've been entertaining whether Aldous's dispassion was a, a kind of caring cold fishness, a kind of, um, a kind of uh, the, the neurosis of a culture, the kind of fear of intimacy, the fear of uh, uh, distancing himself. Was it reserve and psychological defense? Because that would be a reasonable argument. Who then, in the course of his life, was brought into a deep, deep, intimate relationship with the mystery. And if that is the story of his life, then it is an incredible hero's myth of somebody that starts out within the intellect and then tames the intellect until he is that wisdom heart out of which intellect speaks. And that is a hero's journey that any of us would love to emulate, to get out of being caught in our own minds. But I've entertained another speculation. I've considered the possibility that he's just a very old soul. He's sort of like an old llama who took birth in a certain culture with a certain style. And that as his life went on, he was just looking through culture and then moving for the proper metier to express the wisdom he had all along. And that first he did it within the, that kind of um, skeptical social satire with incredible erudition, his wit with its innocent mockery, his aesthetic sensitivity and moral charm, his basic kindness. In the 20s, this was Aldous. And this was the darling of the avant-garde, of the intelligentsia of Europe. They couldn't wait for his next book. He said the problem with arts back then was that they disrupt the social systems. And all the avant-garde did, yay, viva l'art, viva the arts. But then what happened is, as all this started to go deeper into mysticism or look for a different way of forming or finding there were people that could hear a different route, he started to change. 
and many of the followers weren't ready to go with him because now he was ready to say that the arts might be a problem because they trapped one in dualism. Therefore, he was suggesting that non-dualism was to be valued. And most people in the arts weren't ready to go that route. And so they started to refer to Aldous as a lay preacher with little to say which he went on saying. Who, someone who had lost his genius into fuzzy, confused mysticism. I love it. I love what happens when you turn and you leave behind the mainstream. I mean, once you have opened to the joy of sharing the unshareable, the endless delight of speaking the unspeakable, you do sound like a preacher saying it over and over again. But each time it's fresh because it's always pointing at the silence. So all this went through these uh, stages, perhaps as a, an old being finding his form, because he said, said at one point, I always knew of my inner being. And that reminded me of a beautiful, beautiful line from a wonderful great saint in India, Ananda Ma. Extraordinary, extraordinary being. She had millions and millions of devotees. She was just a free, free spirit. And at one point she was meeting with Yogananda. And Yogananda said to her, Ma, who are you? And she said, Father, before I was born, I was the same. And then I took birth, and I was the same. And then my parents arranged for my marriage when I had grown, and I was the same. And before you now, I am the same. And later, when I am in the halls of eternity, I shall be the same. That is the wisdom space, the space of timelessness, the space of spacelessness, the awareness, the rigpa, the brahman, the, the space within which form dances. And it was, it seemed as if all this was in that space of awareness that was delighting in the forms arising, existing, and passing away. The words I remember most in being with Aldous were extraordinary. <laughs> another one was, how odd. And another one was, curious. He, I remember feeling like I was a sort of a butterfly on the end of a needle that we were all sort of interesting exhibits in the museum of Aldous's perceptual universe. <laughs> and that quality of equanimity and delight in the way the forms exist So at that point, if you can hear this possibility that the ending to Island and Brave New World are themselves just another part of the dance. And in all parts of the dance, your heart is breaking, and in all parts of the dance, there is joy. There's one more preface, sort of, that I like to talk about, about all this is, uh, about one of the provocative points. For many of us who grew up in a very um, coercive cultural context, conceptual structure about what was real.
and then had the initiation of a psychedelic or trauma or some mystical experience that took us out of that. We saw in a moment how deeply, deeply enmeshed and trapped we had become in the cultural structure. I lived in the time when I was at Harvard before I took psilocybin. I lived in a time where I was a scientist and science was the high priest of the society. I lived in a time of philosophical materialism when God was seen as an anthropological curiosity. I lived at a time where the intellect was the ultimate arbiter of truth. And I was so sure of that and I transmitted that belief so vehemently that I was rewarded by the society again and again. I was a member of the team. And then I took this psilocybin and I realized I'd been had. <laughs> that the universe was infinitely richer than my petty conceptual structure. And everything my parents had said was just who they thought they were and how they thought it was and what they thought I was. I had bought what they thought I was. That's who I thought I was. With a various set of neuroses I picked up in addition to the ones they gave me along the way. Because I grew up in what all this refers to as the telephone booth of single family dwelling. locked in a telephone booth with two to three other people for 14 to 20 years. <laughs> it's interesting, when I was growing up, a divorce was a no-no. And later, when my friends started to divorce, I had all the no-no in me. We've got to get back to the single family unit. And then I noticed that some of my friends divorced and then they remarried and then all four of the parents became friends and the kids had two families to go to and I realized I was jealous of the kids. Up until then I was feeling sorry for them. They were children of a divorced family. How terrible. And suddenly I saw the space that they had. And so I, then I think about all this is mutual adoption clubs in Ireland. And I saw how he took that idea and spread it into the extended family in which there is a support system of love and identity and looseness and space to play one neurosis off against the other. Now I've asked myself, it was so hard in 1961 for me to break out of that model because it was trained in me so heavily. What conditions would I change in the education and caring for a new being into the species to make it possible for that moment of transition to occur more easily, to be able to be integrated more into the, the wisdom world? for me to be integrated more. Because the experience I had with the psychedelics was a violent, discontinuous moment from where I had been looking at the universe, which then became a subsystem. And in a way, all of our work in thinking about the development of the child, and this is what all this was deeply involved in in this work, was an attempt to find the way in which a child passes through the phase of necessary dualism that is a proper preparation for them to once again entertain non-dualism to ultimately integrate the two. Because for a child to learn the terrain there seems to be the requirement that they become somebody before they can become nobody being somebody. Although they start out in that spaciousness, but then, as Aldous points out in Ireland, 
the dualism is necessary for the socialization process to work. So I look at all of this in terms of how would a culture prepare people to be able to have commerce with the mystery to balance the life of their expectations and hopes and desires and fears and suffering and all that of the world of form or how to integrate formless and form. Just to give you a little feeling of the darkness of the vision of Brave New World. And the reason it's important and the way in which Brave New World is provocative to me is because so many things have crept up on me in our culture that I would hardly notice were it not for a presentation of such a dark mirror as Brave New World against which to look and see this. There are so many ways in which television, technology, transportation, ecological shifts, all of them have come, they're so, they've blended into the terrain so much, advertising, I hardly notice. And then I read Brave New World, And, it's, and I say, when I look at the Brave New World, I say, it couldn't happen now. And then I look, and it has happened. It has happened. Or it's happening. In Brave New World, the story opens in which you are at the hatchery. Because the concept of mother is now an obscene term. We don't need mothers because we have given fertile women six-month bonus in their money, salary, to donate their ovaries to the state. And these ovaries we keep in a hatchery where we can speed up the process of them producing eggs. And then as the eggs are produced and fertilized, the eggs enter into a process of gestation during which they are treated in assembly lines in various ways, according to Bakanovsky's process. And the babies are decanted, they're not born. And the extraordinary social engineering, and you've got to hear that this comes out of the natural following of Ford's creation of the assembly line and the realization that now we can control nature in the sense of the movement of materials and the only chaotic element in that is the human individuals that have to push the buttons and change them because they may get unhappy at their jobs or something. So we have to socially engineer them to play their part so we have perfect production machines. Because the children, the purpose of the children in Brave New World is for production and consumption. It is an economic model of reality. It is for an efficient and stable society in which the individual has been sacrificed into the society. This podcast has been brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate all the support for the Foundation and for Ramdas's work, and we hope that you will continue that support. You can go to ramdas.org and click on the Donate Now button and follow the prompts. Thank you.